So this uh, short talk entitled Some Quick Thoughts on the Big Picture of Learning Analytics Interoperability really is to explain a little bit uh, what some of my motivations are for writing this publication. Um, I started really from thinking about, you know, at a, a macro scale, what is the um, the benefits that you might achieve from interoperability and what are the, the pros and cons on either side of the this kind of cost equation? Where might we make savings from scale and consistency of what we might be doing? And here, I'm not so much talking about the, the quantity of data, absolutely, but the number of times you might go through a particular iteration of a processing cycle, the number of units of processing. And clearly, we have you know, the possibility that uh, you might have an idea like plug and play, where you achieve some saving because of consistency of the interface. Um, but also, you might have an, an idea that the increased scale of operation might drive, say, from daily prediction updates. And so scale and consistency may be related, but there may also be slightly different issues here. On the other side of the equation, clearly, you know, what, what does it cost um, to achieve interoperability? Now, we tend to think, um, if we're talking about, thinking about learning analytics interoperability, um, as being people interested in, in learning, education, and training um, on that particular part of the, uh, the equation. But um, I think it's important, really, to think about what the whole process is. And this really is where um, the idea of the big picture came in, just to sort of think, you know, if we are talking about analytics, where does it start, where does it go to, and what steps are involved in it? Uh, this is a fairly informal representation you know, I say here, simplified and idealized view of what is done to the data as you go around this cycle. And clearly there are lots of things there, and some of these will have aspects that are um, specific to education. So in the integrate section, may, you may be integrating data from various um, learning systems, um, you may be incorporating reference data, um, somehow that maybe relates to, to course structures and outcomes. Um, and then maybe into some, some more statistical processes around cleaning and pre-processing to normalize the data, to impute missing data. Uh, and a, in a production environment, this is, is possibly um, fairly similar to what you might actually have in terms of what happens to the data. Uh, maybe if you're talking about uh, exploratory um, analytics, it looks a little bit more like this with a lot of, of crossing over intersection. Maybe in the process you'll be uh, you know, making quite a lot of change to your scripts, hacking things around, seeing what works and what doesn't, visualizing, um, really getting to understand the data. So you might think this is, is still um, not a good case for interoperability, but actually probably there are quite a lot of repeatable patterns there. And because of the iteration, there may well be um, uh, a good potential there to uh, have a, an easy interoperable interface between different parts of the, the overall process. So within this, I think we need to ask some questions. You know, where might we find scale? Um, where would we have consistency? Where could we do so if we were to increase the amount of interoperability that exists in the system? Where could we be able to move some of our inconsistent data models, for example, to be a slightly more consistent view of the world and therefore enable some of these savings? Um, where might there be a low-cost implementation of interoperability? And that might arise from things like you know, a low cost from commodity uh, software and tools. Now, I think the problem is, for the answers, it rather depends on what you're doing. In general, as I've just said, I think if you look for um, generic cases, um, places where the process is not very domain specific, we're likely to have the possibility, at least, um, if we're talking about generic analytics activities, of there being uh, commonly available tools. Um, but the big question really is, you know, if we haven't got the data that's about learning, then we still can't be doing learning analytics. So we really need to think still about, you know, um, can we get the fundamental data before we can even think about the generic languages? And so the, the balance here is difficult to be very contextual. We might expect that within the, the, the more statistical area, um, which I've very broadly outlined here, um, is where we're going to find some quite generic activities. Um, and for these, uh, the intrinsic scale uh, is going to be a big plus there. And you may already be able to find interoperable tools um, that are not specific to learning analytics, but will get you uh, an awful lot of advantage. Domain specific areas, um, I think typically here in terms of accessing the data and integrating it is really where you need to understand um, some of the educational training context that's there, what this stuff means. It's impossible to integrate data without understanding what it means that part of the inquiry process is going to be much more 
domain specific. Um, and I've already mentioned the idea of data integration being a particularly problematical thing. And I think this is one of the kind of the key areas people find when they start to look at different learning systems um, is to say, well, okay, we've got this thing there. How can I relate it together? How can I um, pose some educational training related questions when I can't really understand how the data fits together? And similarly, if we have uh, each time to go fishing in the database for things, this is a very problematical process. It's unreliable. It relies upon maintaining scripts there. It may break as the database changes. And these are all particular issues. Now, one of the things uh, that is common today actually is a fairly simplistic kind of process where we pretty much move from capture storage um, through to communication of small graphs on dashboards, for example. Um, and uh, this probably has, has been kind of the main reason why people have looked particularly at things like the Experience API there. You know, it provides a, a, a good way of capturing things, but actually, we need to go a little bit further and thinking about where are we going with learning analytics. We're probably thinking about doing um, batch analytical processes there. What are the kind of questions start to come in? And this is where the, the bigger picture um, is important. So the main points really here, uh, I think so far uh, as a community uh, in learning analytics, uh, thinking maybe things like Experience API, the IMS Caliper work, um, we spent quite a lot of attention on the so the capture learner activity, the attention metadata here. Um, and these have often used quite generic languages, which is a good idea. For example, the idea about you know, a, an actor, a verb, and an object as a way of describing things so that we have um, th this comes from activity streams of the web standards used in, in IMS Caliper and also in the Experience API. And it provides a very generic way, which is not really specific to an, an educational context. Um, but you know, it's not the only place where we might be able to gain advantages through interoperable approaches. And I think uh, there are some uh, domain neutral approaches. For example, uh, the predictive modeling markup language, maybe something where we can um, take advantage of existing tools there to be able to achieve some of the benefits of interoperability without having to deal with some of the more complex domain specific questions. And for more, uh, you probably should go and read the article. Here it is, Learning Analytics Interoperability, the big picture in brief.